be a city council issue as opposed to just the health commission. So, looking out of time, uh, Erica, are we about to go? Yes, we are ready to go. Anytime and, you'd like to, yes. And I'm just looking down at, at uh, numbers. It looks like we do have a quorum. Yes, we do, actually. And uh, All right, perfect. Do you want to um, in, invite the uh, general public to join us? Uh, yes, I will. I have this started meeting the is recording being recorded. and the meeting, and we may begin. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, May 10th meeting of the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Uh, we are thrilled that everybody can uh, join us and that the uh, pandemic in Los Angeles is at least uh, uh, somewhat under control and that the numbers are uh, dropping precipitously. Um, I would uh, ask for a roll call, please. Yes, Commissioner Avila. Commissioner Stratus. I believe Commissioner Stratus is here, but she was having difficulty um, unmuting herself last time. She, she looks like she's unmuted now. Lorraine, could you, maybe if you can't unmute, can you open up the uh, video and just like put a thumbs up or wave to us or text the city clerk or something that would let us know that you're here? Why don't we move on to the next and we'll figure out what's going on technologically with her. I will do that. Uh, next, Commissioner Gavidia. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Grimmig. Present. Commissioner Hissrick. Present. Commissioner Cato. Uh, Commissioner Cato is actually uh, trying to get in also. We will come back to him if that's okay. Uh, Commissioner Calfani. Present. Commissioner Lemus. Commissioner Mandel. Present. Commissioner Ossie. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Pack. Commissioner Shannon. Present. Commissioner Sorota. Um, and I see Commissioner Stratus. I'll go back to her and then Commissioner Cato. And we can go back. But there are eight commissioners present at this time and a quorum commission president. Thank you. Can we have approval of the minutes of the April uh, commission meeting, please? This is history. I'll move approval. A second. Thank you. All any, right. Any comments or questions about the uh, minutes? If not, can we have a vote, please? Y yes. Commissioner Estradas, and again, I'll follow up with her on the muting. Commissioner Gavidia. Yes. Commissioner Grimmick. Yes. Commissioner Kisarik. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Kato was absent last meeting. Commissioner Kalfani. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Lemos is absent. Uh, Commissioner Mandel. Approved. Uh, Commissioner Ossie was absent at the last meeting. Commissioner Pack is not here today. Commissioner Shannon. You're stuck. Commissioner Shannon. She looks frozen, right? Yeah, you're frozen. Okay, we'll fall back. And Commissioner Sorota. Thank you. And that is seven eyes, and those minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, anybody from the Neighborhood Council 
uh, in the hall area. Seeing none, can we move on to public comment? Um, yes, and if I may read out the call-in for information, Commissioner. Please. And as stated on the, as on the agenda, members of the public who would like to offer public comment should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-909-7326 and press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Is there anybody in the queue? Hello, everyone. We have one speaker in the queue. I will welcome them right now. Good evening, speaker. You are on the line with the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Call with the phone number ending with 678. Please press star 6 to meet yourself and state your name and the agenda item you are speaking on. Again, call our number with the phone number ending with 678. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself and state your name and agenda item you wish to speak on. Going once, going twice. Going three times. Speaker, please speak. If not, we'll move on to the next. They seem to be unresponsive, and we have no further no further callers in the queue, so we can now continue to end the public comment. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll move on to agenda item number one. It is uh, my pleasure to uh, invite the world-renowned uh, Dr. Aparna Soni, who is a health economist and assistant professor at the American University, who is an expert in uh, narrow health networks uh, and health outcomes of uh, public behavior. Uh, professor Soni, we're honored and thrilled that you would spend time uh, to present to the uh, City of Los Angeles and the Health Commission. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Mandel, and that was a, a bit of an exaggeration. I'm certainly not world-renowned, but I do hear that in L.A. people do give exaggerated introductions, so <laughs> I will uh, take it as that. Um, I will be sharing slides. One of the occupational hazards of being a professor is that it becomes nearly impossible to present without slides and a whiteboard, so I'll be using both. Um, so thank you again. I am thrilled to be here uh, to speak about narrow network insurance plans. I'll plan to speak for about 15 minutes or so and then save the remaining time for question and answer. Um, I will ask uh, if you can hold your questions until the end, but if there's a clarification question, please feel free to interrupt at any time. So before moving into narrow network plans specifically, I thought I would start with just a broad overview of health insurance more broadly, um, what exactly health insurance does. Now as an economist, I focus on the health economics literature, and I tend to draw from studies, and I continue to do that in this presentation as well, uh, studies that are designed to find causal relationships. Uh, as opposed to correlational relationships or associations. Uh, so these findings that I've mentioned here on these slides, um, we can be pretty sure that health insurance actually causes uh, these effects, and it's not simply a correlation that people who are insured tend to have uh, fewer barriers to care. It is that being insured actually reduces cost barriers to care in a causal way. Uh, similarly, having health insurance, giving a person health insurance, increases some types of preventive care utilization. Uh, not all preventive care, um, but there is evidence that people who have insurance are more likely to have routine checkups and flu shots. There's been very little impact on health behaviors uh, either in either direction, so there's not much evidence that having health insurance 
either worsens health behaviors or improves health behaviors. They tend to stay the same. Uh, but health insurance does increase early detection of cancer, which has been a major public health priority for uh, decades now. It reduces some types of mortality, particularly cardiovascular mortality, and improves personal financial outcomes. Um, that's actually a, a very important one. Uh, health insurance has been shown to reduce financial risk, uh, reduce bankruptcy, and just generally improve financial outcomes for people. Now, the impact of insurance coverage, though, does depend on the quality of the plan. So depending on what type of plan a person has, you know, these um, outcomes may be more or less pronounced. And that brings us to the topic of today's discussion, uh, where we're going to discuss um, narrow network insurance plans. So if for a moment we put ourselves in the shoes of an insurance company, the insurance company earns revenue through premiums. So um, patients, employees, for example, employers, or any enrollee uh, who is enrolling in a health insurance plan would pay premiums. And the costs of the insurance company are those reimbursements that the company pays to hospitals and providers for the care that the patient uses. So the insurance plan has this incentive to try to control their costs. They want to lower costs. And one way that they can do that is by creating a provider network and negotiating reimbursement rates with that provider. So the insurance company is trying to get as low a reimbursement rate as possible. The provider is trying to get as high a reimbursement rate as possible. And they end up with this network of, pro of providers, which can be either very small, very narrow, as depicted over here, or uh, quite large, uh, broad or full network. Um, the, there's no exact consensus on the parameters that define a narrow network, and that I'll mention later is one of the challenges uh, to designing policy regulation is that um, people tend to have very different definitions of, you know, some people say that if the insurance company, if the insurance plan covers fewer than 30% of providers in the area, it's considered a narrow network. And I've found some studies that say I've, the plan covers fewer than 90% of um, hospitals and doctors, then it's considered narrow. So there's no real consensus, but generally narrow network plans are those that cover a smaller percent of the hospitals or healthcare providers in a patient's geographic area, and these full broad networks cover a large percent. So narrow networks, essentially the way that they work, the reason they're advantageous uh, for insurance companies especially, is that they give insurers bargaining power against providers and thus result in lower healthcare prices. So how does that happen? There's a narrow network plan, and um, in, in exchange for, essentially in exchange for being part of this narrow network, the providers know that they will get a high patient volume because that particular insurance plan doesn't have too many providers. So they know that the insurer is essentially directing high patient volume to, to them as a provider. And in exchange for that high patient volume, the provider is willing to give a lower reimbursement rate to the insurance company. So for the insurance company, this then means lower costs since they're paying less to the provider for each service. Now, what does it mean for patients though? Uh, there's this trade-off for patients between premiums and the quality of the coverage. So patients do have lower premiums in these narrow network plans, and that's why many of them choose to enroll in narrow network plans in the first place. Um, the insurance company can pass on some of their savings in the form of lower premiums. But because the, the plan is so narrow, it might adversely impact their access to care, their choice of providers, and their financial security. Now, narrow network plans, as we're all probably well aware, are growing rapidly. They've been growing rapidly for the past uh, couple of decades or so. Um, this wasn't always the case. About 25 years ago, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we actually saw a shift to broader networks. Um, but healthcare premiums were skyrocketing, 
11% a year on average at that time. So insurers were looking for ways to contain their costs, and that is when they began to favor these narrower networks. And we saw that in the employer-based insurance market, for example, narrow networks made up about 15% of plans in 2007. This jumped to 23% by 2012. And since then, it's grown even higher. And these narrow networks are even more common in the individual insurance market. On the ACA market, about 75% uh, of plans are, have narrow networks. This is up from about 25% in 2014 when the marketplaces just opened up. It's very likely that uh, some of the ACA regulations have actually accelerated this growth since insurers can no longer use their traditional cost cutting tools like, uh, for example, denying coverage to people with pre-existing conditions or excluding benefits like drug coverage, uh, imposing lifetime limits, uh, there's the Cadillac tax there now, which imposes tax on high cost health plans. So insurers have lost a lot of these tools that they've traditionally used uh, for cost cutting. Um, and they're turning to one of the few tools that they do have left, which is offering these low premium, low cost plans with smaller networks. Although the trend is more pronounced in the individual market, even um, the group market, the employer-based insurance market, even Medicare Advantage, uh, we see a, a lot of narrow network plans popping up. So how have these narrow network plans actually impacted patients? What does the research show? Um, there's been an increase in surprise billing. So patients who don't know what providers are in their network, they might go out and see a specialist. Uh, turns out the specialist is out of network and the patient is later surprised with a huge bill when the insurance company uh, denies their claim or tells them that they, you know, their doctor was out of network. I will say that this is mostly anecdotal. Um, there's not a lot of good uh, empirical study on the extent to which this occurs. Um, it's you know, unclear on whether this is a data issue. It's hard to get data on surprise billing or uh, what the reason is, but there's really not uh, much empirical evidence on to what extent surprise billing occurs. The economics literature has overwhelmingly focused on what narrow network plans mean for total healthcare spending and healthcare utilization. So they've, uh, economists have found that um, even after controlling for other plan characteristics like deductibles and co-pays, Narrow networks tend to have uh, 7 to 16 percent lower premium, and that it ends up being equivalent to about 200 to 400 dollars a year for an individual. And some of these savings even trickle down to the government um, in the case of the ACA plans, uh, because they come down in the for the subsidy amount uh, becomes lower. They also reduce total health spending by about 25 to 36 percent um, a year. And this is, uh, it can come from a combination of uh, lower prices as well as lower quantity. We know that total healthcare spending would be the price of healthcare times the quantity of healthcare used. And studies have found that the majority of that spending reduction does come from lower prices. So these narrow network plans are able to select low-cost providers, and thus uh, the price of healthcare is lower in these narrow network plans. Um, but there is also some reduction in quantity as well. So there is reduction in the, the utilization of healthcare. Uh, in particular, we see reduced visits to specialists and hospitals, uh, and particularly emergency departments. Um, in, for people with, who have narrow network health plans. Uh, interestingly, there's no real impact on primary care utilization, at least that's what the studies have found. One study even found an increase in primary care utilization. Others have found no change. It's just the, the specialty care and hospital care, which really go down in uh, narrow network plans. And we might also be interested in whom these cost savings accrue to. And studies have found that the bulk of savings accrue to the insurer. 
So um, it's the insurer that really benefits financially. They pass on you know, some of the savings to the patients in form of lower premiums, but really the bulk of them accrue to the insurer. Some other outcomes that I haven't noted on the slide, uh, we might be interested in what narrow network plans do for the quality of health of healthcare and um, health outcomes. Now, unfortunately, we know very little about uh, health outcomes. Again, there hasn't been much empirical study. Uh, there's only one study I'm aware of that looks at this question in a causal way, and they only look at uh, very extreme outcomes like mortality, and they find no differences in mortality between narrow network and plans and uh, those in broader networks. Um, but of course, you know, there, there could be uh, some impact on slightly less extreme outcomes than that uh, measure quality of care. Uh, an interesting question is, are patients even aware of network size when they're selecting a plan? And this is important um, from a you know, regulation perspective uh, to understand. Generally speaking, patients pay a lot of attention to premium when they're choosing their health insurance plan, uh, but they're typically unaware of other plan characteristics. And this lack of transparency, this lack of awareness is what really exacerbates the surprise billing that we often hear about in anecdotes or in the news media. Uh, most consumers, just to kind of throw some numbers at you, about 25% of consumers are unaware of their plan's network size when they're choosing their plan. About 10% have been surprised to find a provider that they thought was in their network actually wasn't. Um, in the marketplace, in the ACA marketplaces, these numbers are even higher. About 44% of marketplace enrollees were just unaware of the network configuration of the plan that they chose. And even if they are aware, even if this is something on their radar, uh, sometimes network directories are not always accurate. There was one very interesting study in which the researchers pretended to be patients, and they called a bunch of providers listed in Medicare Advantage network directories. It turns out that half of the providers listed were duplicates, uh, making the directory look artificially big. And then of the, the remaining, the non-duplicate entries, only half of the physicians listed actually accepted the plan and were accepting new patients. So oftentimes these directories can be misleading. Now, there is evidence that if they're given full information, patients do value narrow network plans. Um, the average marketplace consumer in California, for example, is willing to pay about $46 per month for a broad network plan, uh, as opposed to remaining in their narrow network, meaning that they probably value that narrow network at about $46 per month. And for older consumers, um, this number is even higher. But the, the lack of transparency is a problem. And as a whole, the economics literature, although it doesn't advocate forcing insurers to contract with more providers, but economists definitely say that transparency and having perfect information is a must for well-functioning markets. Now, the current regulations regarding network sizes uh, tend to be kind of qualitative and vague for the most part, particularly the federal standards. Um, you know, rather than being quantitative, they tend to use very sort of vague terms that um, can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, for example, the ACA requires that marketplace plans maintain a provider network that is uh, sufficient in numbers and types of providers and you know, services should be provided without unreasonable delay. You know, who knows what these things really mean? They could be interpreted in different ways. Uh, there are some quantitative rules. For example, networks on the ACA plans have to include 30% of essential community providers. Um, they have some rules about transparency that marketplace plans have to update their network directory once a month and it has to be available online. Um, but in the absence of, you know, real quantitative federal standards, many states have been left to enact their own regulations regarding network sizes. And we can review some of these in the, the question and answer section if there's interest. But to, just to kind of conclude here, the general consensus in the health economics literature 
is that narrow network plans can help to keep costs low uh, with little evidence of impact on the quality of the ex at least the ex most extreme health outcomes, but we don't have a lot of evidence yet on um, really how it impacts these intermediate health outcomes. And although we hear anecdotes about surprise billing, that's certainly tragic. Uh, for the majority of consumers, narrow network plans, at least the option for them, uh, can be a way to save money. Uh, the consumers get to experience lower premiums, and um, they are willing to spend about $50 a month more um, for a broad network, suggesting that they, they value these narrow networks at about $50 a month. But, the, and this is an important but, the value proposition that networks offer really depends on transparency and consumers' understanding of how they work. So increased transparency is really the key, uh, as well as insurance literacy, improving insurance literacy of enrollees. The online marketplaces make it very easy to shop around based on premium, but not so much on network size. Another challenge here is um, measuring, there's how to measure network breadth. Um, there's really no consensus on what constitutes a narrow network. And if we don't have a universal definition, then even if we had a way for consumers to shop around uh, network size, they, there really wouldn't be a, a good uh, you know, universal unit of, um, of network size. And another thing that I didn't mention here, but a challenge uh, for regulators is that these regulations that are governing networks often interact with other insurance regulations. So for example, um, you know, there could be these unintended side effects of uh, regulating insurance, uh, narrow network insurance plans. If, uh, for example, there's an, in another cost-cutting tool like accountable care organizations, ACOs, and regu strict regulations on narrow network plans can affect uh, how uh, ACOs work. And we can go over this uh, during the Q&A more if we'd like. Um, but just to conclude here in your handout, you have a, a couple of slides of studies if anyone is interested in reading more on narrow network plans. Uh, these are some recommended studies that I would suggest starting with. All right, so I'll stop here and open it up for any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, an excellent uh, overview. Um, I'll start off with, with a couple of questions and then I'll just remind the um, commissioners to raise your hand in the participant uh, area so that uh, I'll know who wants to ask a question. Um, so off a little tiny bit in, in that in looking at uh, what what uh, you said it was forty six dollar uh, price differential um, if they know but the reality of it if, if people are buying on the exchange at least in LA City or LA County uh, ninety percent of people are getting subsidized so in reality it's not even forty six dollars um, if they're being subsidized uh, eighty percent or ninety percent. Uh, in reality, that it's only costing them, you know, maybe four or five dollars a month or less, um, and that's not well known by the consumer and/or the population. Um, is there um, any state or locality that has a mandate that the insurance companies or their exchange educate the population of their trade-off, but it's really costing them? for the opportunity to have more uh, uh, capability of going out of network? Yeah, that's a good question. And there's nothing that I'm aware of. I think transparency has been a, a real issue. Um, there are uh, the couple of, the couple of um, ACA federal regulations that I had mentioned, which require the um, ACA plans to update their network directories once a month and um, make these network directories available online and in hard copy on request. Um, however, they don't, um, you know, they don't really have a way to, to enable consumers who might, be, you might not even know, you know what a network directory is or that's something that they, they should, should be on their radar. It's something that they should be looking into when they're choosing a plan. Um, I think that that would really be you know, the, up to the, the the discretion of their navigator who's helping them choose the plan, 
Um, and there's no, you know, real regulation I'm aware of, at least, that requires um, these marketplaces to kind of provide this information proactively without the enrollee asking for it. This second question that I, I have, at least, and, and again, I realize that networks are, are different uh, uh, as well as uh, exchanges are different, but um, in California, at least, um, if somebody was on the individual uh, plan and went on to the exchange, um, they couldn't even buy a uh, reasonable plan that would allow you out-of-network coverage. It's just it's, it's non-existent. Um, um, so our state might be a little bit different than the other 49 states in, in the District of Columbia, um, but do you have an idea of what other states do and whether there are, in fact, uh, the capability of buying a broad network or an out-of-network coverage that's anywhere reasonable in price? Yeah, so um, that's definitely a, an issue that I think that many states face um, because 75% of plans on the ACA are um, these narrow network plans. And um, some states have enacted you know, some legislation to try to get around that. So for example, South Dakota has this legislation called Any Willing Provider, um, which means that insurers have to cover any provider who's willing to care for patients at the negotiated price, uh, even if they're out of network. Um, basically restricts the ability of the insurer to, to really leverage the narrow network, but it provides patients uh, a way to seek care out of network um, as long as the provider is willing to provide it at the negotiated price. Um, there's some states uh, like Vermont and Delaware, for example, that have established standards for the maximum geographic distance uh, that people can travel to obtain primary care. So again, it doesn't solve the, the problem for specialty care, but at least for, um, per, for obtaining primary care, patients know that no matter what plan I choose, I know that I'll have access to a primary care physician, you know, say less than 30, 30 minutes away from me. And um, other states, this was actually even uh, predating the ACA. Uh, so some states, Colorado, uh, Missouri, Montana, a few others, uh, they require that insurers that don't have in-network providers to meet a patient's needs allow the patient to obtain care out of network at that in-network cost-sharing level. So um, this is kind of one step ahead of the any willing provider legislation. And um, there are some, you know, not in the, the individual marketplace, but um, there's some analogous regulations um, in other settings. For example, Medicare Part D, CMS has defined these therapeutic classes of drugs and requires insurers to cover at least some drugs in each class. So you have a lot of choices in Medicare Part D. It can be overwhelming that you at least know that, you know, no matter what plan I choose, there's going to be some basic coverage for these major therapeutic classes. And you can imagine that um, you know, maybe theoretically in the, the individual insurance market, something similar could be done, that uh, there could be these specialties that are defined and you require insurers to cover at least you know, a couple of providers in each, um, in each specialty. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans also have these star ratings, which are determined in part by patient satisfaction with their access to providers and wait times. So uh, the ACA market plans have recently um, started those as well, uh, which will hopefully increase transparency. The, the, um, there are people who can buy or through their work get plans that allow them out of network coverage, but with a different uh, cost share or a deductible. Um, unfortunately though, if somebody calls an insurance company, at least here in California, they're always told not to do that, um, and uh, the, the uh, pressure on the patient to go out of network, the, the cost shares have, at least here, become such that it's almost as if they have high deductible uh, plans that, that they're trying to put out of business all the patients, all the doctors who are not in their network, kind of using their mar market power. Um, has that been a problem in other states as well, or is this just California? Um, yeah, I haven't, um, 
I haven't heard of that particular issue. I do know that these, um, these types of plans that you're talking about, the ones with these uh, tiered networks, which allow patients to receive care from a broader set of providers outside their network, but with you know, higher out-of-patient costs uh, than if they go in-network, but not quite as high as if they go uh, completely you know, to somebody who's not even covered in any of these tiers. Um, so they do reduce spending as well, not quite as much as narrow network plans. Um, but that has been proposed in, you know, by economists as kind of an alternative happy medium uh, is to make greater use of these tiered networks. Um, now, of course, this all hinges on consumers having the correct information. And if they're, they're getting distorted information from their insurance companies, then, um, you know, the, it, it doesn't work the, the way that it's intended. It, the market doesn't function that way. Right. So the, the other question is, is that, uh, as you mentioned, that sometimes specialty care is very difficult in, in the networks where there's long wait times for, for uh, specialty care. And so, for example, in L.A. County, 50% of the population ha has uh, Medi-Cal, our, our type of Medicare, uh, Medicaid. Um, and so if you, if you look at patients in those networks, um, it's virtually impossible to get a appointment with a psychiatrist or an endocrinologist um, anywhere within um, you know two hour drive, um, and if you want to see many other subspecialties, for example, a surgeon who specializes in pancreatic surgery, um, you, you're basically going to get another general surgeon who doesn't really specialize in pancreatic surgery, um, but is um, you know has done two pancreatic cases in the last five years. And so officially they can do it, um, but clearly don't have the experience and or knowledge uh, as opposed to somebody who's doing those kinds of surgeries all day long. Now, what recourse does the general patient population have um, against their insurance company when it turns out that their narrow networks are really not a narrow network, but a non-existent network? Yeah, that's, um, you know, and there are some states that have tried uh, to address the, the wait time issues. Um, Montana, for example, they, um, they insure, patients in Montana are insured access to urgent care within 24 hours and uh, non-urgent care with symptoms within 10 days, um, routine care within 45 days, basically limiting their wait times. Um, but there is, you know, nothing there for, um, there's no limit uh, for uh, specialty care or, um, you know, so I think that the, the best in my view, I think the best um, sort of course for that is uh, that Part D, Medicare Part D type of a regulation where we have these uh, defined specialties and require insurers to cover, you know, at least someone in each specialty. Um, otherwise, it, it becomes very difficult for the patient. You know, the, they, the insurer could come back and say that you had access when you decided to enroll in this plan, you decided to purchase this product, you did have access to the provider directory, and that's something that you should have, you know, looked at before you purchased the plan. It's easy for the insurer to protect themselves that way, and it becomes difficult for the patient. So, so from your analysis, um, it looks like the greatest savings um, actually go to the insurance companies and their profit, um, and to the government, one government or another government, because. If they're paying, uh, you know, subsidizing the ACA as, as much as they are on the exchanges, then the narrow network savings really go to them. And so the consumer itself doesn't really get it. Um, why is that not restraint of trade by both the federal government and uh, the insurance companies uh, working together basically to decrease their costs, but actually hurting uh, choice of, of uh, patients? Yeah, so the, the um, you know, some of the cost savings do get passed on to the patient and in, form, in the form of the, the lower premiums. So that number that I had given, uh, 7 to 16 percent lower premiums for those who are on net, narrow network plans, um, that actually controls for, you know, plan characteristics. So a plan with a broad network plan with the same deductible and out-of-pocket pay, uh, out uh, payments, out-of-pocket costs, would be seven to sixteen percent more in terms of premiums, and um, I believe the reason there's that range is the the seven refers to uh, those who do receive premium subsidies, and sixteen percent refers to those who do not receive 
premium subsidies in terms of their, their savings. Um, so there is you know, certainly a, a lower premium. What the, the exact number is that an insurance company should be expected to pass on uh, to consumers, I guess that that is um, you know, still, still kind of uh, subject for study. Great, thank you. Commissioner Shannon, you have a question or two. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, so I want to talk about, if we can, some of our um, unhoused community and very low income um, folks who um, primarily this is the population that I work with. Um, so here in California, if you are on Medi-Cal, right, which is the state's version of, of, Medi of uh, Medicaid, um, you automatically get put into one of these narrow networks into managed care. And it's very hard for patients here to navigate through this system. And, and I would say it becomes increasingly more difficult um, given, um, you know, their particular problem, right? Like it, if they have like a severe condition, it seems to be, uh, much harder for them to be a specialist or to get uh, into a hospital that actually specializes in what they need. And I'll give you an example, which is that there's a patient that I know um, who has diabetes, who has um, very large wounds on the bottom of his feet and lesions. He was in a hospital that didn't have a hyperbaric chamber, didn't have um, access to proper wound management, and and then in the process of wanting to um, move that patient to another hospital because it wasn't quote unquote in network, even though it was a hospital that actually could help this person, um, they refused the transfer. And so it feels like a lot of um, patients just get caught in this web, right, in the system, and they can't get out of it to get the help that they need. So um, I know that you said that there are other states that have regulations, um, but, you know, it just seems to me patently unfair that uh, the poorest folks here, particularly in Los Angeles, um, don't get the help that they need just because Medi-Cal here is automatically putting them, you know, into, into a managed care system as opposed to just letting them go to whatever doctor takes Medi-Cal, if that makes sense. So, are, you know, do you see that in other states? Do you think that this is, you know, primarily just California? Or because you don't have an option here if you're on Medi-Cal to be in non-managed care. Sure, yeah, yep. Um, sorry, did you finish your question, Commissioner Shannon? Um, I have a couple more, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so this, um, I'll just address this one first. So, you know, California is a state where it's, it's quite uh, famous or infamous, I should say, for having particularly small uh, networks. You know, on average, not Medi-Cal, but on, on average in the, through the entire insurance network, through the entire insurance market, um, networks tend to be narrowest in California and most exclusive uh, of all 50 states. And um, they, they tend to be much more broad in other states, Nebraska is actually, interestingly, the state with the, the broadest network. And the unfortunate part uh, regarding Medi-Cal is that you know, these patients are, are not making a decision, right? They're not making a rational decision to enroll in a narrow network plan because that's what they believe is best for their health. Oftentimes, healthier patients tend to like these narrow network plans because they're unlikely to use a lot of specialist care and they would prefer to have the lower premiums. That's not the case in Medi-Cal if they're not really given a choice. It's almost like, um, you know, a monopoly market, as we might think in, uh, in economics terms, that uh, patients have to buy this product, but they, they have no other, you know, option. <laughs> they only have one choice. Uh, other states, the way that they have dealt with this is that, um, you know, they do have choices for patients who qualify for Medicaid. So some might go into Medicaid Advantage, some might go into traditional Medicaid. Um, in some states, they'll automatically assign patients uh, to one plan or the other. In other states, they would allow patients the choice. Um, some states, like uh, Indiana, for example, where I uh, studied in um, their Medicaid programs, they have 
uh, small premiums that enrollees pay um, so they can you know, choose plans, but they, they do have small monthly premiums associated with that. That is a, a trade-off. Um, so that's one way that other states have dealt with this is um, by kind of creating some options. And uh, again, the key is really ensuring that patients are well equipped to make these decisions. They have the information, they have the, the insurance literacy to um, make these choices if it's, um, you know, if the choice is given to them. And in the absence of that choice, I think that other regulations would be required to ensure that patients who don't have access to, to an in-network provider but have a need for some health condition can obtain the care out of network, you know, within a reasonable time. It might be worth looking into um, a couple of those states that I had mentioned, Colorado, Missouri, and Montana. Uh, studying those states in uh, more detail and understanding exactly how, how they're able to, to do this. Great. Um, so then if someone were on Medi-Cal, right, and then they qualify for Medicare. So Medicare is their Part A, and then Medi-Cal is Part B. Does Medi-Cal then, and Part B, I'm guessing, is more outpatient services. I'm not old enough to be on Medicare, but these are some questions that come up with my clients. Um, so if Medicare is Part A and Medi-Cal is Part B, but Medi-Cal like, is mainly managed care, does that mean that for any outpatient services, they get stuck in this narrow network? I think that's the way it would work. Yeah, so Medicare um, Part A would only cover uh, inpatient care, um, in-hospital care. And if they're on Medi-Cal for Part B, then that means that the majority of their care that they're receiving out of, uh, out of outpatient, um, you know, out of the hospital setting um, would be subject to the, the Medi-Cal rules and regulations. That's how I imagine it would work. So that means that even if they're on Medicare, they never escape this narrow network. They're kind of forever stuck if they're low income. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, that's Medicaid has um, a number of studies have shown that Medicaid has a lot of benefits uh, for poor people, but certainly there's much more that can be done. And I think the program can be designed in a much better way. Um, so the studies I had mentioned on the, the very first slide, what health insurance does, um, just kind of broadly speaks about, you know, on average, what do, if I give a poor, poor person health insurance, I'll probably see their access to care increase, I'll probably see their cost barriers to care go down, I'll probably see uh, increased earlier detection of cancer, lower cardiovascular mortality, uh, on average, but the, the exact outcome for each individual, for each state, would really depend on the quality of coverage. If, wow. if I could jump in just to answer that also, um, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Um, if somebody starts off and they have straight Medicare, and then they get Medi-Cal as their secondary, then they actually have full choice to go to any Medicare provider as an outpatient um, as well as for an inpatient. If a oh, okay. selects Medicare Advantage, then they're squeezed into the narrow network, and about two-thirds of people in L.A. County who have Medicare do do that, so there is, they're stuck into the narrow network. Alternatively, if somebody had Medicaid, Medi-Cal in California, and then become disabled and get Medicare, then they're already in the network, so they're stuck in the Medi-Cal Advantage network and they have no choice. Oh my God. Okay. But to, so it depends on which happen. which came first actually. So it's kind so of if they're on Medi Cal and then they get Medicare, maybe just because they turn sixty five, is that different? No, then they have full they have a choice they it, it re they have, the positions. they have a choice to either pick Medicare Advantage um, or regular um, straight Medicare. If they have straight Medicare though there's this there's, there's secondary costs, because Medicare for outpatient doesn't pay 100%. And so they either have to get a secondary plan, or if they're low income, they can then get Medi-Cal. Med med so that's called Medi-Medi. It's a little bit different. 
um, the Medicare cost share is for both inpatient and also outpatient. So Medicare does pay for some outpatient care, not all. Uh, okay. okay. That's why people buy supplemental plans. Um, but if you're low income or have no income, then you're eligible for, for Medi-Cal to, to, to uh, be in that. But if, in that circumstance, the Medi-Cal portion ends up being the narrow network. Got it. Um, and then one final question. Do you think a single-payer healthcare model would be better than what we currently have? Um, or what, I mean, what model do you, because I, I will tell you, like, my daughter's pediatrician is like a boutique doctor um, who doesn't take any insurance. And I'm finding more and more that doctors that, like, I would prefer to send family members to um, are becoming boutique doctors and just getting away from the insurance system altogether. Um, so, what, what would you think about a single payer model as opposed to what we have now? Because we, we do have um, legislation, which is the AB 1400, that's um, kind of on hold. It's like a, what we call a two year bill here in California um, that basically says that you can't have managed care as part of a single payer healthcare system. And to me, that sounds pretty good, you know, at this point, because I've just seen so many people not be able to get the care that they need. Sure, yeah, and a you know, single-payer system um, certainly has uh, many pros and some cons, but the, you know, the fact of the matter is that today 87 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured. So clearly um, you know, something, and even those who have insurance, as we uh, discussed today and the, the many examples that you brought up, that insurance is you know, often not sufficient. Uh, to cover their their health care needs and um, you know something definitely needs to change right we can't um, we can't go on this way we've seen uh, many adverse impacts of uninsurance and underinsurance particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic and the way that it's uh, rolled out in the U.S. Um, so we know that you know there are multiple pathways to get to universal coverage um, a single payer plan is uh, one of them and um, there's certainly an economic argument uh, for a single-payer system in the sense that uh, in a single-payer system, it can cut down these exorbitant prices that we see in healthcare. Um, essentially, it creates a, a what we call a monopsony in uh, economics, which is when there's one buyer of a service, which is medic, which would be the single-payer system, and uh, many sellers, which would be the the healthcare providers. And that gives the, the buyer significant bargaining power. And, um, you know, we would see lower prices uh, for drugs, for healthcare services, uh, for hospitals, ED. Um, so certainly there's this economic argument uh, for a single payer system. Um, it would change the, the financing and provision of uh, a lot of the, the care, the access to care issues that we see today could be resolved. Um, there, historically, there's been a lot of opposition, though, uh, to single-payer systems, as long as we're all aware, especially in the, the U.S., um, so it, it becomes a, a political issue, I guess, in addition to an economic issue. Great. Thank you so much. This has been super helpful. <laughs> Commissioner Hissrick. Thank you. Thank you for welcome to California, even if only virtually. Thank you for your presentation. I guess the Kaiser system, which covers several million Californians, would be considered a narrow network, if I'm not mistaken, albeit with hundreds of physicians and literally millions of patients. But my real question was, individuals often are not the ones to deal with the insurance companies directly. If they're employed, Usually their employer or their union kind of goes in and sets the parameters. Have there been many studies in your experience of what role those, I guess, fiscal intermediaries, for lack of a better term, uh, play in determining how this is shaped? Yeah, um, so, uh, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, the um, how the, the existence of the employer as an intermediary between 
the patient and the insurance company, how that affects um, the the type of networks so that these well, insurance. Uh, the the insur the employer I, I recently participated as the, on a board member of an organization with an agency in the, that that then on our behalf negotiated with the various carriers to come up with a package that then is presented to the employees so they have a limited scope of what they can choose they can choose Kaiser or this plan, you know, and that's, so in a sense, that's not pure negotiation with the carriers, but with somebody who then goes and negotiates on behalf of them. Sure, yeah, yep. So um, if we think about the incentives of the employer, uh, typically the employer is covering a, a large portion Make of sure the premium of right. as well. So they have an incentive to keep premiums low, which is why we have seen um, such a growth in narrow network plans, uh, even in the, the employer-sponsored insurance market. And, um, you know, many large employers are self-insured, uh, so they have a, an even greater incentive to keep costs low as well as keeping premiums low. Mm -hmm. um, so employers, uh, I would guess on average, employers have an incentive to um, use these narrow network plans uh, kind of as a tool to keep their premium flow from their side, and if they're self-insured, keep their healthcare spending low by um, uh, maintaining these low prices uh, from providers. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think employers would be an effective, uh, you know, entity, I guess, to, to vouch <laughs> for patients in that sense. Um, simply because oftentimes, especially large employers, their incentives are, you know, almost more aligned with the insurance company. Right. Yeah. Keep the prices down and keep the costs of them down. Usually in those situations, in my experience, the only employees that choose unlimited situations are those that are quite ill and have already established a relationship. And usually their costs are running pretty high anyway. So. And that is kind yeah, of yep, and, yep. Then that's one of the, the strategies of narrow network plans is, um, you know, it's a way for insurers to essentially cream skim and right. uh, entice the, the healthiest enrollees, which is another way that they keep the premium flow in these plans. The younger employees, the healthier employees, up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Not sure there was a question there, but there was a discussion. <laughs> Commissioner Cotto. Uh, thank you so much um, for taking the time uh, and patiently uh, answering all of our questions. Um, you know, on our agenda, it says uh, narrow networks in healthcare insurance markets leading to poor health outcomes. Okay, and so is that due to limited access or what would be the major um, yeah. cause behind that? Sure, yeah, so there are, different, um, there are different categories of health outcomes, I guess, and there are some that have been very well studied, others that have not been very well studied. Um, so the, the ones that have been well studied are uh, basically utilization of care and healthcare spending, if you want to think of that as an outcome. Um, so these studies have found that healthcare spending certainly goes down with narrow network plans. Utilization of specialty care goes down. Utilization of hospital care goes down. Um, there's less provider choice, especially for mental health. Uh, so to the extent that, you know, you would think of, uh, say, access to care or utilization care as a health outcome, we see decreases in these things. Now, what we don't know much about, though, is um, you know, the, the, downstream, um, the downstream effects of these, uh, these things on a person's health status. So there's not much evidence of whether narrow network plans actually lead to poorer physical health or poorer mental health. Uh, we know that people use less of mental health services, how that affects their, you know, actual 
probability of developing mental illness or depression or uh, you know whatnot is is not yet very well studied. Um, so there's only one study that has really kind of tried to address this question, um, but because of uh, lack of data, they um, they looked at mortality as an outcome, and they didn't find differences in mortality between people who were on narrow network plans and broad network plans. Um, but, you know, mortality is such an extreme outcome, maybe you wouldn't expect to, to find a difference there. Rather, you would find, um, you would, might expect to find differences in other measures of uh, quality of life. Um, so that's something that we unfortunately don't know much about. There's just, you know, a lot more data that is needed. Um, you know, you can easily just, if you want to do a simple compare and contrast, you can easily just compare consumers who are on narrow network plans with those who are on broad network plans, most likely you'll find that those who are on narrow network plans are actually in better health um, for the reasons that we just had talked about in the, the last question. Um, these consumers tend to choose narrow network plans because they're healthy. It's not that the narrow network plan is making them more healthy, um, but in order to, to draw that causal relationship, we just we need better data. You know, as uh, Commissioner Shannon uh, pointed out, that yeah, there are a lot of homeless people um, that have no choice, right? And so they're funneled into the narrow network plan, not because they're healthy, but because of the limited options. And um, I think, you know, that could, you know, correlate if, you know, services are delayed to to poor health uh, outcomes, and, and that hasn't been measured quantitatively. Uh, uh, is there an attempt so, to measure that yeah, quantitatively? It, it has. Um, there have been these correlational studies, and I think you know there, that's certainly true that there is a uh, you know, sizable homeless population in these narrow network plans, but uh, overwhelmingly the enrollees are you know, not, not low income. They're, they're not necessarily homeless or low income. They just they, they tend to be healthier people who, um, who have an option, uh, they're given an option by their employer, whether to go on a, a Kaiser type of a plan, say, that has a narrower network, or a plan that has a much higher premium, but a broader network, and they, they're okay with the narrower network. Um, and they, they're okay because they, they tend to be healthy. So, um, you know, that's, uh, the, the data kind of show that on average, people in narrow network plans are healthier, but that does not mean that the narrow network plan is what's making them healthy. And just one point of clarification. Yeah, I'm used to terms uh, PPO and HMOs, and you know, you're using broad and narrow. Is the narrower network even narrower than most HMOs? Uh, often? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, both narrow network plans and HMOs limit coverage to a select group of hospitals and providers, um, but narrow network plans tend to be even more restrictive than HMOs in terms of their providers. They generally have uh, even lower reimbursement rates and lower premiums. Um, HMOs um, require that you, you maintain a, you know, a, a primary care physician and get referrals from that PCP in order to see other specialists. Uh, narrow network plans may or may not have that requirement. Most likely they would, but the way that they're defined is by the percent of providers that they cover in your area. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, President uh, Mandel. Thank you. So I'm following up on, on, on both Commissioner Cotto's question and, and also uh, Commissioner Shannon's um, commission uh, 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 question. Um, what we see, unfortunately, is that there's a manipulation of the marketplace. And so what we know historically is that these narrow networks really didn't exist um, until uh, the early 90s, uh, 93, 94, and then they started to grow dramatically um, after the balanced budget amendment in 97. Um, and then they started to increase, and then they exponentially grew as Medicare rat ratcheted down its payments um, with the SGR and then, you know, with the creation of the uh, ACA, there's been an increased amount of the narrow network. And I, and I think there's clearly a direct relationship between 
Medicare cost controls and Medicaid cost controls, which then cost shift the true cost of healthcare onto both the employer-based market as well as the independent uh, market. Um, and then the narrow network is a way to, to attempt to ratchet down the price to some consumers. When there is a monospony, such as a single payer either by state, district, or nationally, um, there's nobody to cost shift any longer. So what happens then? There's no sense you won't need a narrow network. The entire network will be narrowed because there'll be people dropping out of uh, providers unless you, you mandate that physicians and hospitals have to be in the network. Is that not true? Yeah, yep. So, um, you know, the, the equation really changes when you have a single payer system um, because the, that need that insurers have to form these networks as a way to uh, cut down their costs. And, you know, network size is currently it's one of the least regulated tools available to insurers since the ACA and, you know, other previous regulations have uh, narrowed the, the toolbox that insurers have so much to regulate costs. Uh, so network size is one of the few tools that they have left. But a single-payer system is very different because you know, there's naturally going to be a lot of pressure on providers to lower prices. They only have one buyer, right? They only have one buyer to choose from. So if they don't provide the service at the price that the buyer, the, the single-payer system is willing to pay, they will have no business. Um, so there's, there's a built-in mechanism to lower costs in a single pair system, whereas in the system that we currently have, network size is you know, one of the, the many tools that insurers use, and it's um, you know, something that, that can lead to these adverse outcomes for patients. So, so if you look at Medicare in, in Manhattan, 50% of physicians in, in the borough of Manhattan um, don't take Medicare at all, and, and so um, it just bodes poorly for Medicare for all, whether it's the state of California um, doing a single payer system um, or the state of Vermont that penciled it out and realized they couldn't, it couldn't afford to, to do it if you're going to pay real costs. In, in um, LA City, 50% of hospital costs are salaries primarily to nurses or nursing units. Um, if you ratcheted down and have the payer mix such that it's at um, Medicare and Medicaid rates, um, then you end up having hospitals um, not being able to make their budgets, which is why here we've had multiple hospitals close in the last three years, including St. Vincent's Hospital and Olympia Hospital uh, currently uh, closing um, not too far from, from uh, City Hall. And so my concern would be when people advocate Medicare for all to get rid of the, the insurance market um, is that then we'd have to really address the true costs. Are there any studies uh, looking at um, the, the cost savings um, or w would there have to be a market increased payment for the Medicaid system um, in order to um, prevent hospitals from going bankrupt? Yeah, so, so um, it's a, a little bit off of what we see in the, the current setup, just because, you know, for example, in Manhattan, perhaps one of the reasons that many hospitals don't accept Medicare is because they have many other options, right? So they have uh, a huge population that's privately insured, and uh, Medicare is, if Medicare offers lower reimbursement rates than the private insurance companies, then it makes sense for the hospitals to just focus their business on the privately insured. Um, if there's no other, um, you know, if there are no other options, though, for providers, then the equation changes very much for them. So there's just, you know, there's so many moving parts. Um, Medicare for all or the single payer system would have a lot of negotiating power, but they still need to provide a service that is valuable to patients. Um, so if the 
the set of providers available becomes so narrow that, um, or becomes so small that, uh, you know, that, that insurance product is no longer valuable and there'll be pressure from the, the patient side um, to maybe provide, uh, you know, higher <laughs> reimbursement rates for hospitals. But eventually the, the price uh, should settle to a point to where um, patients are receiving the services that they need and um, providers are, you know, getting the, the reimbursement rates that they need in order to provide these services. Um, there certainly are disadvantages of the system, though, and we've seen in some other countries that have single-payer systems that they there do tend to have long wait times. Um, there's arguments that maybe the, um, the availability of services is uh, perhaps not so good as it is, and not as good as it is in the U.S. Uh, for the privately insured, at least. Um, so there are certainly cons of that system as well. The, the other big difference is if you look at the United Kingdom, um, they, they created Holly Street as an alternative for the uh, upper classes to uh, pay out of network um, and not stay in the National Health Service, which is why Canada outlawed that and prevented it when they created their system. Um, unfortunately, a big difference if you look at the um, uh, United Kingdom Commonwealth countries that all have um, single-payer systems of one sort or another, um, their tort system is different than the United States. And so uh, in, in those countries, uh, you, uh, if you litigate against a hospital or a health provider, um, you have to uh, pay their legal costs, uh, which is not what happens here in the United States. And so there is a big difference in the cost structure and defensive medical practices in the United States, given the constitutional right to tort, um, we'd have a big problem uh, if we uh, mandated um, healthcare costs, they would skyrocket. Um, and if you look at, again, hospital costs to primarily go to salaries, mostly to nurses, uh, and then to pharmaceutical costs, um, there's a big cost difference to um, salaries of uh, nurses in Los Angeles City versus outlying areas. So for example, nurses in LA City get paid 40% more than they do in the San Gabriel Valley, you know, half hour, 45 minutes an hour um, east of here. Um, that would be problematic if you had the whole entire county of Los Angeles um, in one pair uh, salary for, you know, um, DRG or RBS code, whatever because um, uh, there'd be no motivation for nurses to drive um, to Los Angeles if they're going to be paid the same amount of money. So it's, it's a complex uh, issue. Um, any other commissioner have a question for uh, our speaker? Seeing none, uh, Professor Sony, we're uh, really uh, thrilled that you would uh, stay up late and, and uh, uh, lecture to us, uh, your uh, comprehensive uh, um, talk uh, was superlative and uh, you're very humble. Um, you are uh, one of the leading experts uh, on uh, impact of uh, networks and uh, health outcomes. Uh, we're really uh, honored that you would uh, take time from your busy schedule to uh, speak to us today. Uh, we're really thrilled that you, you came. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. With much appreciation. Thank you. Uh, you, you're welcome to stay on if you'd like, or, or, or uh, we just have some uh, some uh, business. Uh, we won't take it personal if you, you sign off, and, and uh, uh, we realize it's, uh, I think, 10.15 uh, or 10.20 10, uh, uh, DC time. Uh, we're, uh, once again, really thrilled that you uh, came to present to us today. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, item number uh, two, um, any other uh, suggestions or ideas that people have? Uh, Barack? Just a, just a quick one. That uh, effective January 1st, 2021, the rules for Brown Act and social media changed. Um, and I, I, I can, and I've actually given this presentation about four times. I, I usually call it don't hate the messenger, hate the message. 
Um, it deals with legislative bodies. Um, it is dealt with all Brown Act bodies in the city. So this would be one of them. Uh, it doesn't deal with agencies necessarily at all so far. The long and the short of it, um, I can give a presentation if you want the next time. But what it means, I'll give you just the, the quick rule. The quick rule is if you if you are, if you're on your social media and you're talking about the subject matter jurisdiction of this of this you know city health commission, which could be everything, um, and say. President Mandel, you post an article, and then say uh, Commissioner uh, Shannon either does a thumbs up or an emoji or responds to that article, that's actually a violation of the Brown Act now. So if, if you posted an article and Commissioner Shannon wanted to send that article out, that's fine, but you cannot use emojis a commissioner, and it, this is not a majority of the commission anymore, it's actually individual members. So there's some different rules that have shifted uh, in the Brown Act landscape with respect to social media. I don't think that's an issue necessarily with our commission. I haven't heard that. But just as a, it's, it's an interesting wrinkle. So if you want me to take five minutes next time, I can do that to educate our commissioner, you know, the commissioners on this issue, if you want. I think that would be a wonderful uh, uh, educational opportunity for all of us. And, and then, um, if, if you don't mind, um, Councillor, um, that we won't have you in the first position um, because of our guest speakers, uh, but we'll put you down as, as either number two or number three, depending how many. I'm fine. To, I'm fine to be after future discussion items, actually, too. So that's good. Well, we'll, we'll put you. We'll put you above future uh, discussion. But but we we, uh, uh, we were supposed to have another uh, speaker today who just uh, on Thursday um, asked us to bump him to uh, June because of um, some other um, uh, responsibilities that he has uh, professionally, and so. Um, uh, well, I think we're going to have uh, two really wonderful speakers um, for June, um, and, and then if, if it's going to be a relatively short presentation, 5, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever, uh, we, we can put that down as a third agenda item. I think that's wonderful. It would be, it would be, it usually it takes a lot longer for questions than it does for the presentation. The pre presentation could be anywhere between three and five minutes because it's so new, there's not a lot out there on it. Um, so, if, but if you want to kick that to July too, it's up to you. Uh, whatever the commission, whatever um, you all think is best. So, but it will take five minutes. The questions can be a little longer. That's usually an issue. I see that the council is going to begin meeting in chambers, at least in part, in June. Uh, is that going to happen for commissions and so on? What's the plan there? Uh, maybe Erica can also speak to this. Here's the, the issue from what I've heard is it's if you're vaccinated, um, they are meeting, but City Hall is not open still for public. Even in, even, and there's no word on it yet in June. Okay. Well, we'll probably continue here for a while. Huh? Yeah, the, the other thing I, I, I would say from a healthcare point of view is that um, even doubly vaccinated individuals, um, have some chances of catching the virus, um, and though our numbers are down and our positivity rate is only 1% currently, um, I, I think it would be imprudent for us when we're working so well with the Zoom for the most part um, to jump in yet uh, until the, the risks go down, um, given the fact that there are um, numerous individuals of this health commission um, that potentially would be a slightly higher risk if they did catch the virus. Um, I think that my recommendation oh, yeah. to this position would be uh, not to put people at risk. Um, and, and if we were going to have 30, 40% of us, 50% uh, of us not there, we might as well keep on doing it this way uh, until the fall. And we'll see how the numbers are, um, you know, uh, going forward from then. And then maybe consider that. I think it's been working very well, actually, online, considering the fact that we don't really get, quote, an audience when we're in the, in the hall, and we get very good attendance uh, here on the Zoom, 
it's it's working well. I agree. Um, the other thing that we, we just to to, to um, talk about a little tiny bit um, is uh, theoretically uh, we should have an election, um, which um, for for I don't think I'm president for life, um, but but. Uh, um, so we should that there should be some discussion um, at at the June meeting of how we're going to have elections going forward uh, for officers. Um, I'm more than willing to stay on as president. I'm more than willing to uh, become an emeriti uh, if somebody really wants to be uh, uh, the president. Uh, but that's a conversation we should have. Uh, um, at least, at least um, going forward to the summer. Classically, we had the elections um, in July or August. Quick, um, President Manda, just a quick question, and we don't have to get into the weeds about it. So, is it what's the process? Is it nomination? Is it the Vice right, Chair, just curious of what the process has been in the past. We, 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 we've had nominations from the floor and, um, and then totally democracy. It's, it's not really been overly competitive. Commissioner Cotto. Commissioner Hissrick, your hand's always been up this whole time. Uh, you might want to lower it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was in the uh, participant uh, area in regards to, he, he asked a question uh, of our speaker. Okay, um, I, I have a request. Uh, I don't know if um, anyone saw, in, I think it was Sunday's paper, there was the uh, uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation paid for a full-page ad about this uh, $100 million uh, homeless challenge. I don't know if Commissioner Shannon saw that. Um, they're, asking, um, they're asking for the city. It was addressed to the mayor and the council, but it also involves people from the county to, to cooperate. Um, and they're... Um, Proposing to pledge a hundred million dollars to uh, in the next two two years create up to a thousand homes, which I guess comes out to about a thousand a home, which is a lot less. And so, um, I'd like to see if you know someone from the mayor's office can uh, address whether some of these requests are possible or not, and someone from the county. Uh, uh, also, and uh, see, you know, how we can be um, looking to how, how's the homeless. Um, I don't know if people were able to participate in a town hall that the county uh, did on homelessness. I think it was last month or so. Um, but yeah, it's it's you know all the PPP uh, the the, the H H uh, H money coming in Measure M. And they're ramping up. They're having more placement, but still, yet the people going on the street is outpacing their accelerated efforts. So I think you know it's 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 a you know truly concerning situation. And if an organization is willing to put up a hundred million dollar pledge asking for cooperation in exchange, uh, no money uh, from the city and the county. I'd really like to hear the city and the county side of whether what they're asking for is possible, and if not, then why? I think we, can, we could uh, research that, and, and there pr probably is uh, um, somebody who is, is um, representing the city uh, on the, the policy of that. Um, Commissioner Shannon, did you want to say something? Yeah, so we do have a new um, city administrator coming in, Matt Sabo, 
it would be great to um, invite him and ask him about this. I think that would be great. He could get an introduction to the commission. Um, and since the mayor doesn't have an appointee on this commission, I think it's good to establish a relationship. Um, and uh, it, I would love to hear what, what Matt Sabo would say. Because um, I think $100 million, $100 million is exactly what the housing trust fund supposed to be in the early 2000s, and I don't think they ever met it. Um, but yeah, $100 million is, is a lot of money, um, yeah, and it would be great to have someone from the city addressing that. I think we, we could reach out to him. The, the other thing is, is as you're all aware, is uh, the city uh, has been given tons of, of money because of uh, the pandemic. Um, and it's of interest in the budget um, that there was no discussion of having any money going to this commission for either staff support or, or research uh, purposes. It might be nice uh, that um, this commission be given some funding so that potentially we could have uh, one or two MPH level uh, individuals working for the commission to do the work of the commission. Um, as well as um, have some funding so we could uh, do individual research that, that directly relates to the health care of the city as opposed to the county. Um, and so we have previously, several of us have gone and testified um, at the committee that has oversight of this commission. Uh, and uh, I think it would be prudent for us to go to the mayor and ask for um, some funding. Uh, two years ago, uh, I guess it's two years ago uh, when we testified um, uh, at the, com the uh, committee uh, that had oversight of health, uh, we asked for $2 million to be included in the city budget. Um, that was not done two years ago, wasn't done last year, uh, but now that the city also has money that's directly related to the pandemic, one would think that maybe we should go back again and ask um, and so I will do that personally I'll, uh, w without necessarily having a conversation um, or discussion uh, here. Um, I think I'll remind the mayor and the city council uh, of our previous requests um, for two MPH level um, individuals as well as uh, some funding for research um, so that we'd have a real budget to do the, the work of the commission. Um, any other ideas or suggestions? Seeing none, can I have a motion for adjournment? Um, Commissioner Cotto with Sirota as a second. Um, any any uh, discussion on that? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of uh, adjournment, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining on adjournment? Seeing none, it's unanimous. Uh, be safe. Still wear your masks, even if you are uh, been uh, vaccinated uh, when you're in places where you don't know people. Uh, if you're outside, breathe some fresh air if you're not within 10 feet of somebody. Uh, but if you're uh, in an enclosed space or an elevator, still wear your mask, even if you've been vaccinated. Um, it's the safer way to be until the numbers really get lower. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to anybody listening in the general uh, public, uh, please get vaccinated. Uh, the science is clearly there that people who are vaccinated are much safer than people who aren't. And the chances of being hospitalized, being uh, intubated, uh, or ending up uh, in an ICU is so different for unvaccinated individuals, regardless of age, uh, that please, 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 everybody get vaccinated. The uh, CDC is lowering the age uh, down to 12. Um, so if you're a parent uh, or a grandparent, please encourage um, uh, adolescents to be vaccinated. Uh, we will not open our schools. We will not open our city unless people 
um, get vaccinated and uh, we're, we have the opportunity now, there's ample supplies, please, please, please get vaccinated. Oh, sorry, one, one, one other thing. You know, the school year is ending. I, I was wondering if the interns, if there are any that are graduating, and maybe if they are, we should thank them, right? Uh, or whether they're going to continue or not. They did such a fantastic job. Um, we, we have um, uh, uh, three fantastic uh, research, uh, uh, volunteer research associates and interns, um, Lauren Yen, Sarah Koshinyadi, and Marvin, are you still out there? Uh, uh, they're, they're fantastic. They're hardworking. They're dedicated, um, and um, they're uh, available for all every commissioner. Um, if you want them help, they're working on our report. Uh, we actually have some other individuals who are going to help us uh, with our report. So we're going to, as they're getting out of their school year, um, they're going to focus on that a little bit more. Um, they're luckily not going anywhere, um, even though they're graduating, um, um, so that they will have other things to do um, going forward. Uh, but they have all three of them volunteered to stay on and work with us. Um, so that they're, we're, we're actually blessed to have them uh, as dedicated individuals. Um, and I'm totally appreciative. This commission would not function without their volunteer uh, efforts. The city of Los Angeles uh, owes them a debt of gratitude. Um, and also, as long as we're thanking uh, people, uh, Erica in, in the city clerk's office, uh, thank you for all you do. And um, Albert, if you're still out there, uh, for the people who technologically um, help us um, get the, the, these meetings uh, done so efficiently, we truly appreciate all your efforts on behalf of the people of the city of Los Angeles. We thank you as well. Thank you. Having said that, we're adjourned. <laughs>